What's up, guys? Give me a, uh, a thumbs up or something <laughs> knowing I'm live. I am not the tech expert here. So, um, so let me just get this out of the way. Zach is out um, doing something other than real estate. Thank God today. So I convinced him to leave me alone in the studio and we are going to spend an hour with you. It's up to you if you guys want to use it. It is a free mastermind from somebody who's been in the business 19 years that it absolutely loves wholesaling, loves anything to do with real estate investing. And Zach is my son. I'm dad, AKA flip with Rick. And I am here to help as many wholesalers reach that six figure mark as fast as possible without actually paying a guru because you don't need to, you didn't pay a guru to learn your ABCs. Why are you paying a guru to learn wholesaling? It is actually simple. It requires some effort, but you would be amazed how effective and how much money you can make in real estate. So, uh, yes, I am starting a little bit early and I love to reward people a little bit early. So, Let's get at it. The truth about getting your first deal. So I'm not going to give you anything that is going to just blow your mind. The, the truth is so many people are so busy studying and so many people are so busy studying courses, um, trying to figure out the best, the latest, greatest craze that that kind of shiny object to make wholesaling easier and the problem here is a lot of you are taking it from what you learned in school so if you're like me you were in school I was actually a terrible student I, I knew I was never going to be a good student and I was taught my entire life because I wasn't a good student I'm going to fail in life and especially in business and here I am at age 51, and I'm going to tell you, my inkling was correct when I was in school. Uh, I was diagnosed ADHD, although they didn't back then. Um, I thought everything they taught was kind of boring. I asked questions like, why am I ever going to use algebra in real life? And why are we studying science, especially chemistry and biology, when I understand like the basics, but you're teaching me at a high level. I'm never going to regurgitate this information again, only to find out I was actually right. So we, we all take tests and we train and we regurgitate the information. We get an A, you get a high five and you're done with the information. It leaves your brain <clears throat> and it does not. Well, what it does is it prepares you to be book smart. I was terrible at book smart. I couldn't do it. Uh, Zach is actually really good at book smart. Um, Andy's an entrepreneur, which is a rare thing. But I could out hustle anybody. I could outthink anybody. And I never confined myself to a box. And I was told I wasn't a bright guy. Um, I had a 2.6, 2.7 GPA pretty consistently in my life. And that was on a, on a good semester. And I wasn't book smart. What I learned in the long run is not being book smart was probably my greatest asset in life because I had to find ways to get other people to do things for me. And to this day, the people I know that are the absolute smartest, I mean book smart, not smart smart, is they all have J-O-B jobs. And I'm not not going to have a job. I did it for uh, 12 years um, and I tried to go to the college. I did that. I got my degree. And... Um, they just trained me how to be a good employee. And I, deep down, I never really wanted to be an employee. I wanted to go on my own journey, create my own dream and have my own freedom. So me not being book smart was probably the greatest thing that ever happened to me. So any of you guys are like struggling a little bit in school or like you just don't make that connection. It's okay. It just means you're not like the rest of them. And we're taught in society. If you're not like everybody else, you're the freak of nature and you're never going to make it. So Fast forward to today, I got a lot of book smart friends and they all wonder like, how do I maintain, how do I get a lifestyle that I have? And I just told them, I actually, guys, here's the secret. I don't even walk them down the journey. I rather share the journey right here with you and tell you the strategies to get deals done. 
So I'm not book smart. And I thought that was a liability. It was actually one thing an asset because I just go out and hire book smart people. I get them at discount rates and they do most of the work for me. So let's talk about the truth of getting your first deal. The, the biggest truth you have to understand is it requires action. So you hear this word massive action. I hate the word massive. You just have to take daily consistent action, no matter what it is. And anything that's going to make you uncomfortable and makes you feel exposed is going to be the right step. For years, I thought I was in like this own world before I talked to a lot of investors. Remember, I didn't have we didn't have groups like this and I, I couldn't bounce my idea off somebody without paying them 10, 20 or 30 grand. And I just I always told my wife, I go, I, I feel like I'm out in this blue world. And then I constantly used to try to bring family members and friends and teach them how to do wholesale deals to change their lives. And they thought I was absolutely nuts. So I decided years ago, I'm never going to walk someone down the journey unless they really, really want it. And I can't make it any, any easier than you guys right now because I'm offering this for free. Why do I offer it for free? Number one, I'm not a co like I'm not in the coaching. Coaching to me reminds me of those days when you sat in the classroom, you got lectured, you did an exercise, you got graded on it. Um, business does not work that way. You actually have to go out and apply yourself. Every month, I, my company, spends money on marketing. Now, we're very calculated how to do it, but if I lay out five, seven, or eight grand, or even 10 grand, I know exactly what I'm gonna make on my return. You know why? I've been doing it 19 years. Um, I still have to take that risk every day, just like you have to take a risk in getting your first deal, or if you're working on your fifth or your sixth deal, Guys, here's the big secret. You have to take action. I'm not, I hate the word massive action. It's beyond abuse. So here's how I compare it is if you are out there comparing yourself to Rick Yin, Zach Yin, I don't care if it's Max Maxwell. I, I don't care if it's Carlton Sheets. Just get that crap out of your mind. You're never, you're never going to be that person. I don't want you. I don't want you to be me. You got to be authentic. You got to be yourself. Number one. Number two, most of you in your minds have this false perception of what it is to be a wholesaler. Like I, I have to, I have to have X amount of contracts. I have to do five deals a month because Rick did four. Rick did five guys. I need you to just do one, do one deal, learn from the process and repeat it and refine your systems. And the truth of the matter is we're all in different markets. So for me to come up with one course, Zach to come up with one course, shove it down your mouth. I don't care if I charge you $97 or $97,000, it's gonna be the same information. So it means Zach said, hey, let's just do it for free. And that's the secret is you have to take action and you have to be accountable. So if I invite you on a call, I know you guys do it with Zach and you guys know he does it. They're gonna ask you, what are you doing and how are you being accountable? So you can sit here and we can have a conversation. You can bitch and whine all you want, but I'm gonna ask you, how many phone calls did you make? How many letters did you send out? How many doors did you knock on? How big is your list? What is your plan? And if your plan's not working, how are you going to pivot and adjust to it? Guess what, 19 years, I have to do this just about on a daily basis. So um, we talked about book smart, and let me just compare it to this side. So my son did cross country for a while. He also um, did wrestling. And when he was younger, I would teach him just to run your race. And he was like, dad, what do you mean by that? I said, run your race you've prepared in your head and don't let anybody else. So if you've ever ran a race, particularly con country, you'll see guys speeding by you or gals speeding by you. And then you'll see a guy or gal real slow behind you. And then another one speed by you. And what happens is you start adjusting your race to everybody around you. And the problem with that is you go off your game plan and you try to compare yourself to somebody else. You have no idea if they've prepped for the race, what they're doing, and you're going to change your plan on the fly. So many of you guys do that by going on Facebook groups and going, well, he said he did 15 deals. Guys, the number of deals you do is irrelevant. It's actually BS. Okay. Um, I've done as many as zero deals in a month. I've done as many as 15. Um, I've done one deal that's yielded more than most people would do in two or three years. Which do you want? I want you to be profitable. 
have time to do what you want and really just be happy along the journey. So, um, so back to the cross country story. So it's so easy when you're running a race, which you're doing in wholesaling, especially getting your first deal and somebody zips by you and you go, Oh my God, like Rick's flying. I got to go catch him. And then you sprint and guess what? You run out of gas. You can't even finish the race. And if you just stick to your original game plan, your marketing plan, how many calls you're going to make, what kind of marketing you're going to do, how many appointments you're going to go on, learn how to negotiate is you will truck by that other person because you had a plan and they were just shooting from the hip. So the only person you're in competition in wholesaling is yourself. And the only thing you should compare yourself is to your previous version. So if you want to be better this week, strive to be better than the guy you were or the guy you were the week before, the day before, the month before. That's your only journey. So many of us have this false pretense. I got to do five deals a month and I got to do exactly what Rick and Zach does. It doesn't work that way. Guys, I was so ecstatic to have my first deal and I'll let you know a little secret. Do not sit here and wait to be happy to get your first deal. You don't need permission um, to be happy. So Tony Robbins taught us all this, enjoy the journey. So get excited, have fun working up to your first deal. I don't care if you got to make 10,000 calls or 10 calls, have fun, give yourself permission because when you do your first deal, you go, okay, well, I get three deals. Then I'm going to celebrate. And then you're going to say, when I do five deals, and then when I do 10 deals, and you're never, you're going to create this false perception, and you will never, ever live up to the expectation. So what I'm telling you is the secret to getting your first wholesale deal or your fifth year or 10th is you have to take consistent action. The word massive action is it's not correct because you can take a lot of the wrong actions. So massive it's, it's a cute word but I, I i just you got to take precise consistent action so if you take a lot of action on monday and you don't take any more action the rest of the week you're wasting your time it doesn't work that way so um and then as you're going along the journey uh, and it, sorry about that enjoy it don't wait till you get to the destination and go okay now i can be happy and that goes for life in general guys so it's um i put a lot of pressure when i did my first deal and I was so happy, it was such a rush. And I will never ever forget that moment and I still get that same experience every deal. Um, our team had brought in some really good deals this week and it was just like, I'm just, I just enjoy it. I've learned to enjoy it. I don't wait till like, if I get five deals this week, I'm gonna be happy. If I get five deals this month, I'm gonna be happy, it's just gonna work. So the real secret guys here, to getting your first deal is just take precise, consistent action, and don't set this false expectation that you compare yourself to Rick, to Zach, to Carlton Sheets, whoever it is. There's tons of people out there and enjoy your journey along the way. Don't wait to get permission to have fun. You have to celebrate as you go along because you're definitely going to have some trials and tribulations. So without further ado, I'm gonna dive into questions. I might even try to bring somebody on, but I can't promise you because I am I am technology challenged. So uh, I'm kind of old school how I do stuff. So guys, the quality of questions you ask, you use this hour, use me while I'm here. If you don't ask the questions, I can't help you out. So I want to help out as many people as possible. What I'm going to do today is um, for to help you guys out as much as possible. Um, I know I say I try to answer every question. If I see the same um, question consistently, I'll try to at least spread it out so um, I'm not answering the exact same question every time. So um, before we get started, let's see here. Do me a favor, and if you're new to the channel, subscribe to the channel. If you can share it with someone that you think would benefit from the best absolute free wholesaling information on the internet today, um, it's myself, Rick. Um, Flip with Rick. You guys know my son, Zach. He's not going to be on today. He's actually out having fun, which is the beauty of this business. And um, I told him to get out. He actually wanted to help, but um, you guys spend so much time with Zach. So why not spend time with Rick? So, um, but go ahead and hit that subscribe button and let's get into it. So I'm excited. Uh, Friday, remember Friday is no different than Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, and let's roll with it. So
All right, Paul, I appreciate it, man. Good stuff. Um, this thing, I do try to start on time, but I'm not always perfect about it. But um, Chris has it great. Here we go, man. So, okay. So Jan asks, what is Open Door? So I don't spend a lot of time in this. I believe Open Door is a corporation that makes cash offers on property. Um, it's a lot like the um, Zillow offer. And there's two or three other ones out there as well, too. Um, these are just big companies that make an offer on a property. Like you click a button and it usually comes off of like, so like Zillow, they have a built-in cash offer into it. And they're trying to capture on their marketing ability. And they have millions and millions of users and why not? And what they do is basically contract the property. The con they usually take 30 to 45 days to close. They pay a ridiculous rate. And what they're typically doing is working with hedge funds and stuff like that. Um, there's inspection periods. They will discount um, damages on the property and they do charge a commission to do the deal. But I'm not going to lie to you. They are very competitive in a lot of markets. So you need to pay attention. Um, the human element is very limited because they are a corporation usually in another state. So I kill people with kindness. We connect with rapport and most people, it's not a huge issue in my market. Zillow is actually our biggest competitor on cash offers. Um, so I hope that helps out. Anybody can chime in if they have experience on it. So, right, Elizabeth's excited. Gonna ask some questions here. All right, let's see here. So I'm trying to stay on track. Okay, awesome question here relative to what we're talking about. So Leslie asks, I don't know if your picture is that flower or is it coral? So um, how many hours a day realistically do you need to get a deal in one month or less? This is, this is such a variable question. So the question is like, is this your first like shot at doing wholesaling? Have you spent a little bit of time? Have you gone through the flip with Rick videos? Have you gone through wholesaling houses for real? Um, I've seen people get it in a day or two and I've seen people get it in a year or two. It's up to what, how much action you take. So if you take a ton of action and action has to be events that lead you closer towards getting a deal. What do I mean by that? Any type of marketing action, um, mail, door hangers, door knocking, cold calling, SMS texting, referrals, working with realtors, I can go through the checklist. And anybody who jumps on and challenges me and says they're having a hard time, I promise you in two minutes, I'll walk you through and I'll identify what action you're missing and doing. It, it always winds up being an action and that's what I want to get across to you. So you have one or two choices. You can either pivot your action or increase your action or you can bitch and whine about it. People who bitch and whine with it, they tend to never succeed. So Leslie, it's really, it's really up to you. Do you have to put more time in the beginning? Yes, because it's new to you, but it's fun. It's exciting. I love the excitement of the journey and I had fun with it. So um, I got my first deal, honestly, probably between 45 and 60 days. Um, Zach got his first deal in the first under 30 days. I mean, his action was massive. Level. And what I want you guys to understand, he had no idea what he was doing. Absolutely no idea. Um, he ran a bandit sign campaign and then he turned it up with cold calling. And I taught him, all you need to do is get leads in and talk to people that are willing to sell their house for a discount. And I'll help you. We'll figure out the rest as it comes in. So when I started out, I had to wholesale everything my first two years because I didn't have the money to do it. And as you build in the strategic partners, but Leslie, it, it's completely up to you. The question is, how much action you're willing to take. If you tell me how much action you're willing to take, I could probably nail it down within 30 days for you. But um, it's a great question. Oh, I got a, I got official here. It's not a name, but uh, hey, Rick, I'm about to get on the call with a seller pretty soon, and I have an offer price, but it's 80k lower. How should I present it? So I assume it's 80k lower than the seller's expectation or what you think. Um, 
the assumed value is. So number one, if you've already built rapport with the seller, bringing someone like me on midstream will probably guarantee you kill your deal. How do I know this? All the time. So when I used to work with Zach, he's like, hey, jump on with this seller with me. I'd say, listen, just get them on the phone and just talk to them. So you're overcomplicating it. I can't, I used to do a deal with people. I go, I get on the phone with you, but I'm taking 60% of the deal. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you don't learn as much when you do it. So here's my suggestion to you. You're probably nervous about your presentation, which means you probably have the right offer. So you're starting off on the right one. Build amazing rapport and make a connection with your seller. Um, if you're doing it over the phone, your voice is everything. So be confident in your offer and understand what's going on with the property and know what your max offer is. And your first offer should be, should embarrass you, but not get you hung up on. And that's it. The rest is just a conversation. But the, the fact that you're nervous because the price is so off, means you're on right. Now, you're in an aggressive market. You're probably gonna have competition. You need to keep that in mind. Um, if you can get in front, if you're brand new guys, listen to me, if you're brand new, try like heck to get in front of your seller if you're not doing a virtual market program. So um, if you're new and you're starting out in your backyard, which is the easiest way to do it, try to make what we call belly to belly contact. You know why? Because 60 to 70% of all communication is nonverbal. See how I use my hands? See how I look at you in the eye? You see if I look down, I look up. Um, you can tell so much when you're in front of a person. So official, make the phone call. Go make the phone call. Jump back on here if you want. I'll bring you on live and we'll talk about it and we can all learn from it. Completely up to you or you can work with Zach when you do it. But you're on the right path that you're a little bit nervous about it. Just be authentic, be yourself, connect with them, and um, talk through the numbers with them. So, you guys, you're going to get a reaction. That's the fun part of the business. So, Rice says, stay in your lane. I agree. I can put some, you guys can talk amongst this. So, Oh boy, I'm getting phone calls here. Don't worry about it. I'm here with you guys. I can only do one thing at a time. Looking forward to learning. They says, what's up, Rick? So if you guys are just jumping on, Zach is off today. Uh, he has an off day today. So uh, he's been answering texts and emails, but um, we don't have to have Zach for everything. And remember, I got Zach going this business. He's obviously taking it to the next level. Um, is Saturday a good day to cold call? The first part of the day, yes. The later part, definitely not. So I prefer Monday through Friday, but if I'm going to do Saturday, probably um, like 10 to 2. After 2, nobody answers their phone. Where he says, I received my copy of Real Estate Fortunes Are Made. Awesome. Thanks for all the info. Guys, I appreciate all this. Okay, I got a good one here. Thomas 19, how many documents, contracts are needed to complete a wholesale deal and what are they called? So doing an actual wholesale deal, there's only one key document required up front and that is a purchase and sales agreement. It's also called a PSA, which is just an acronym for purchase and sales agreement. And if you use a realtor's version, they can be long as 20 pages, 20 pages plus. They have a condensed version of 10 or uh, five to 10 pages. But honestly, right here at Flip with Rick, we provide you, I believe, with a two page contract. They all say the same thing, it's just simplified. So a lot of people that I buy houses from, they don't want 20 page contracts. It intimidates them and it scares the heck out of them. It doesn't mean they all take it. So um, it depends on it. So all you really need, Thomas, is a purchase and sales agreement and then the document you're going to execute so you can wholesale the property is called an assignment of contract. We have it right here at Flip with Rick. Just search it in there. Um, I made it available to everybody free. And the assignment allows you to sell that contract 
to another person and collect the difference in the fee. That is it. So a purchase and sales agreement. And if you want to assign it, which is what I recommend, it's going to be uh, an assignment of contract. We provide both right here for you. So that's it. Don't complicate it. Um, what you need to do is learn how to find these sellers, how to talk to them and how to negotiate with them. So awesome. Great question. Okay. Well, this asks, do you have a recorded phone conversation? We can listen to it. Just search, man. I got, we got over 500 videos, a million recordings. Knock yourself out. Um, I've probably talked to over a hundred thousand sellers and there's very few things that someone can say to me that's going to throw me off. And guys, the more exposure you get, the more training you get after a while, there's nothing they can throw at you. That's going to phase you. Actually, there's only, there's five, some people call it six objections you can get in wholesaling and every one of them are going to like follow in a category. I can rip like, I can guarantee you throw me an objection. I'll tell you what classification will fall in. Once you know how to respond to them, this business gets much, much easier. Okay. I promise you. So um, look around though. Zach has a million of them. Um, Zach did cold calling for um, a year and a half on his own. Uh, he didn't even hire a VA. He actually did it out of his dorm room and he got all his college buddies to help him out. And uh, he has more information. He has more uh, exposure on the cold calling part, but so the difference between cold calling and doing a final negotiation with um, people, we just got to be careful with people's privacy because sellers trust us and I want to throw all their stuff out on the uh, internet. All right. Big Willie style ask, how did you get started while working full time? I travel some weeks over 60 hours a week. So that's, that's a good question. So I did the college route and, and you know, my dad said, you got to get a good job. And I told you, dude, I, I'm a solid, like, I don't know if it's C minus, it's not C plus, it's just mid C 2.6, 2.7 GPA. And um, I worked for a uh, car leasing company, actually um, enterprise rent a car, great management training program. And I did real well with them. I actually made six figures. Um, and what they kept doing is moving me around the state of Florida and what they do is um, they relocate me more than like 50 miles. They would buy my house, pay the realtor fees. And then I would, um, they actually packed me up and I would take that um, appreciation or whatever. And I keep rolling it up. Well, I figured out the formula. I was making 40 to $50,000 moving every two years. I moved four times with the company. So uh, I started down in Fort Lauderdale, Miami, and I moved about 125 miles north. And I got so good at it. It was ridiculous. So I started buying houses from realtors. I worked with realtors and I would just find the best value add house and I would do it. I was working 80 hours a week and I hated my job and I hated every minute of it. And that's when I started reaching out to see if somebody would help me out. We didn't have all these beautiful tools you guys have then. So, um, I had to pair up some people in the local market. Um, wasn't the best teacher to be honest with you. They just taught me how to buy good deals on the MLS. And I decided I was going to dive into wholesaling and I flew all over the country meeting people and figuring out how to do it. And here's the key. I did not quit my job. So those of you who have this pain, I gotta quit. you know why I didn't quit my job? I had Zach was a baby. I had my daughter, which is uh, a couple of years younger than Zach. I had a mortgage. I had an entire family to support. So um, I just knew I wasn't going to get ahead in the corporate world. And I watched my bosses get fired over and over. And so I came up with a six to 12 month plan. And the beauty of wholesaling, if you do it right, you can choose your method of marketing. So if you're tied up all day and say you want to do direct mail, it's advantageous. You know why? Because the leads come to you and then you can return the calls at your convenience or maybe have a partner or maybe even an answering service answer your phones. Um, but if you're not going to do that, you can do like an SMS campaign in the evening hours, send out a thousand, two thousand of them and you can respond it. So you get 24 hours in a day, Big Willie. I get the same 24 hours. You're just going to have to find to make it work. So um, I don't accept the normal lifestyle. Um, just quitting your job and doing it is not 
if you get really good at wholesaling, you can work a full-time job and do it. So I work about, I don't know, 10, 12 hours a week on my business and I have multiple real estate operations. Um, I have a portfolio of rentals, I have commercial properties and I do wholesaling and I love the wholesaling. But to be honest with you, Zach runs that whole part with the employees and Zach just reports to me and I help with um, raising capital and we all talk together what's the highest and best use. I never see the properties, I never do anything with them and I just run the business. So Zach's knee deep in the operations and he loves it. And so you're working 60 hours a week. You just, you get 24 hours a day. You need to find it. So I assume you need 68 hours of sleep, do your math backwards. But remember this business isn't about how many hours you work. It's how many effective hours you can connect with people. So remember if you do one deal and you make 50 K off of it, you know, would that make a huge difference in your job? And it, it probably would, if you did two, if you did three, and that's how I looked at it. Maybe you can still keep doing your job and find somebody to help you to do some of the other stuff. Um, I'm not a big advocate of just quitting your job. Now, if you're single, you have no responsibilities, knock yourself out because you got nothing to lose. But and age doesn't matter. I didn't start till I was 33. So, ah, uh, says, hey, what's up, Rick? Okay, Elizabeth's got a question. I knew she'd roll in with one. I'm uh, starting with a text. It's a good idea or cold call. I'm a stay at home mom, so I'm kind of hard to keep everyone quiet enough to do hours of cold calling. So, by the way, you'll never have like complete quietness. So, I'm used to it. So, um, I've had the dog barking in the background. I actually had VAs where they had uh, chickens crowing in the background, which created problems for our marketing business. But um, so the first question is you asked, should I do texting or cold calling? What fits your personality? Do you enjoy cold calling? I, it's not my personality. I hate bugging people. Like it's just, it's just not my DNA. I, I just don't like to do it. I do like um, the texting because to me it's scalable and eventually it is going to go away. Is it getting more saturated markets? Yeah, absolutely. But it's it's really easy. So if I'm on a like a limited job or I got you say you got an hour to get stuff done and you got the kids running around. Um, listen, I did this business when Zach was crawling around on my lap while I was doing phone calls and he didn't. I mean, no, most kids don't get it. But the really cool thing, especially. Especially being a stay at home mom is you don't need an office for this business. I repeat, you do not need an office. You just need a safe place in your house. And if you can just get an hour and make phone calls, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, the authenticity, authenticity, when people hear your kids, your dog barking in the background, they know you're for real. So like use it as your advantage. Don't worry about it. Like you don't need this perfect environment, guys. It doesn't exist. It's bullshit. Sorry. It's actually going mad at me on that one. Um, just do what you do. So if you naturally don't like cold calling people, don't do it. Either get a partner or find another medium to do it. And for those of you who go, hey, I'm just going to hire someone to do cold calling. If you don't understand how cold calling works, you're going to be taken advantage of. I see it all day long, especially with you guys think for these three to four dollar VAs are going to produce for you. Guys, if they're three or four dollars an hour and they're working 40, 50 hours a week and they produce you zero leads, you're wasting your time and money on them. And they know it because you they know you don't understand cold calling and you don't know how to run the KPI numbers on it. So Elizabeth, you're not the only stay at home mom. You're actually in the perfect place to do wholesaling. The challenge is when you get contracts and you got to go out, then you got to kind of come up with a plan. So maybe you can have somebody help you out with do that. Try to take them down over the phone. But if the dog barks or the kids screaming or the kids are crying, just don't hide it. Just enjoy it because you can be authentic in who you are and people really love um, anybody who's going to take care of their own kids and stay home and do it should be commended for doing it. So there's no shame in that. So, but just pick the one that fits your personality best guys, be yourself. You can't be Rick. You can't be Zach. Even though Zach's my son, he's very different. He's very, um, he has the same drive and the hustle as me, but we operate a little bit different and that's why we work so well together. So awesome question. Um, uh, 
Okay, so Isaiah asked, Rick, you happen to know anything about wholesaling in Southern California? I just know your prices are expensive over there. Um, I've text blasted tens of thousands of contacts and haven't scored anything. Any advice would be appreciated. So number one, some of the biggest wholesalers I know are in Southern California. So you have to make a shift. I'm going to be honest with you. When you say tens of thousands, it's a very vague number. I don't know if that's 90,000 or, or 15,000. Um, so what I would do is first start with your list. Where are you getting your lists from? What's what's the criteria, the filters on your list? And are you targeting the right list? Number two is what kind of SMS message are you sending out? What's your deliverable rate? And have you tried to connect to anybody in your local market to see if they're having any success? Guys, it's not about comparing yourself to somebody. Is like right now, I just got a phone call of someone I've worked with for years somebody that purchased one of my old products a long time ago in my probate and we've actually become like really good friends and we just share marketing data and we're brutally honest and we're on the other side of the country and it works out really well and he or she tells me what's going on over there we talk here and i learn a lot from doing that so isaiah i do the connections i really look at your list because when you guys are marketing there's a risk when you do it. And if it doesn't work, you have to look at your data. If you're doing over and over 10,000 and you're getting nothing, you have the wrong list, the, the wrong message, something is missing there. So I would go back to the basics and see what's going on and like figure it out. That's what I would do. The list, the, the list is everything. It doesn't matter what you're, if it's not the right list. So I don't know if you're doing high equity, if you're doing vacants, um, I would start with there. Is wholesaling single homes easier than new land? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. A lot of people like land because you don't have to deal with the, the real estate and it's almost always cash and it moves very fast. I like single family because um, you can typically make some bigger spreads, but land moves very fast. Um, you just have to know what your land values are in your particular market. Sometimes it's block by block. A lot of times a single family home, it's much easier to figure out what the value of it, but it takes longer. You've got inspections and tenants. The beauty of, of any type of vacant land is there's no tenants. And that's why people really love them and people avoided them like forever. So Les, which do you prefer to do? Either way, you're dealing with humans. Sometimes people go, man, I can't deal with inspections on properties and I hate tenants. I'm just going to do land. Or people go, well, land's just boring. There's nothing there. I like the single family You do that. You can do apartments, you can do commercial. It doesn't matter. Do what fulfills you the most. I've seen them both make incredible amounts of money. I'm a single family guy. That's just what I do because it's an endless, there's so many clients it's easier to do. Um, but in like South Florida, we're running out of land. So it's, it's getting less and less um, ideal on it. So good question. Okay. Ah, I love these questions. These are getting good guys. So Alexander asked, Hey Rick, how do we research for secondary markets where it's not so saturated? Really, really simple. You guys have the greatest tool. I never had this tool until like three years ago. Actually, I think it's four, but um, just use list rei.com. And all it is, is your connection. You get a seven day free trial with prop stream. I use this for my virtual markets. Um, it absolutely changed how I did um, virtual marketing. Um, it takes a while to figure out a market that you're not in. The data is in there to tell you where the cash buyers are, where the hot areas are. It even has a hot map to tell you which neighborhoods are trending. Now the data is a little bit behind, but you can identify how many cash buyers. You can identify what the average price point is, the average days on market. In the old days, we had to get so much information uh, from realtors, from um, county websites, county property appraisers, public records. It, it was just an enormous task. So, and with listrei.com, it's all included in your subscription. So guys, you get a 70 free trial period with it. Go ahead and check it out. 97 bucks plus you get the 10,000 leads. It's a no brainer. And the pre-probates, we talked about that last week. It's absolutely 
amazing. You guys might hear a train in the background. Um, my studio is out here by the water and we got train tracks. So I'm not doing like trains by hobby. So it's going to like whistle here. So Alexander, um, listrei.com. Let me put it up there for you and that will help you out. So um, really, I mean, the technology is absolutely amazing, but we still have to do the human part. Okay. Great questions, man. Okay, let's move on. Tommy, what's up, buddy? Uh, what's the best way to calculate repair costs in a market? So the best teacher for you is going to be experience. What you have to do is figure out, so if you're working in a particular neighborhood or usually a particular zip code, I always try to like micromanage. Macro, what it costs in, in Southern California compared to Southern Florida is usually night and day. So what I try to do is take my local market and then you can figure out what it costs to repair a master bathroom, um, a guest bathroom, a kitchen, and then the cost for flooring and the cost to paint the inside and the outside of the house. That's all you ever really need to know. If there's any type of major structural stuff, you've got to get like estimates, especially foundation. Um, but like a typical roof on a 1500 square foot house in Florida is between 14 and $18,000. I'm talking about like shingle roof, even metal. That's about the same cost. It's just a huge weight right now with everything going on. Um, a master bath right now, it's taking a lot longer. Um, a master bathroom is running between usually ten to $12,000. I'm talking about putting in a shower, ripping it out, new vanity, make it nice and beautiful. A kitchen, these things have gotten out of control. It's, the options are getting ridiculous. It used to be 10000 in my market to put an average kitchen in right now with appliances is fifteen to twenty, dollars and, and that's not a lot of bells and whistles. Just the costs have gone up tremendously. Um, once you identify that, you can quickly go when you look at it and she's like, yeah, they always say like this, the, the kitchen's a little outdated right off the bat. I know the kitchen shot. So if I am, if I'm going to try to wholetail it, um, or if I'm going to sell it to another investor, they're going to discount what the kitchen is right off the bat. And you need to calculate that in your numbers. As far as painting the inside and outside, it's like always a standard number. Um, the only ones that draw a red flag are smoke filled houses. They're very, um, you can double the price of the painting because there's a huge treatment has to go to get that smoke out. And guys, it's not covering it with kills. So what I want you to do, Tommy, is you can do the estimate. You can even do some internet searches or even work with like some local contractors and just ask them what's the average cost of a kitchen. Do not get into the rehab game. You just want to factor these numbers in when you make your offer. Guys, rehabbing is a sucker's game. I'm telling you right now. Don't be a wholesale flipper. It doesn't work. So I've, I've had many projects I've been talked into rehabbing them over the years. And in the long run, if I just took that property, took it to market, even wholesale, I would have made the same, if not more money in half the time and eliminated my risk. So learn from me. Rehabbing is like a disease. People just feel like they have to do it, especially anybody that ever took the fortune builders class, which by the way is 30 to 50 K they have this disease where they have to rehab everything. No matter, they'll even take a brand new house and try to rehab it. Just blows me away. Good question. Just learn what the average kitchen bathrooms and flooring in your areas. So like paint an average 1500 square foot home inside and outsides five to seven K. So that's light colors. If they have dark colors, you can probably add like another 1500 to that. So good questions, man. All right, Isaiah's got a good one. Rick, I use PropStream for lists. Any other places you like to pull lists? What is your favorite place um, to skip trace? So let's take the questions in order. PropStream's always my go-to with listrei.com. I like the data, plus it's prepaid. And if you do it on a cost basis, I mean, it winds up being like a penny per lead. So you're never going to beat the price through listrei.com. I've tried it every which way, guys. By the way, I've tried every list service out there. If you have a question on list service, go ahead and put it in the questions. I'll just give you the truth on it because I've spent a ton of money 
Um, I've spent millions of dollars on marketing. I can tell you what works and what doesn't. Um, so the backup one I like to use is um, List Source, um, which is owned by CoreLogic. And it's a little bit pricier, but some of their data is pretty good. So um, I like to mix it up a little bit. They have some specialty lists that I can do. So let me give you a little example. So, well, Rick, why would you do, why would you pay more? In a certain markets that I market to, we, we market to townhomes because townhomes are now like the starter homes in Florida. Why? Because they're about 30 to 40% cheaper than a regular house. So if you look at it, 30, 40, those are the new starter house. Well, how do I get that data? Well, PropStream doesn't allow me to um, filter that data. List source does. So that's an example where I would use list source. So if I can use a prop stream, but prop stream, I will be honest with you, listrei.com, their, their vacant data is, it's superior to anybody else's I've done. So that's number one. As far as skip tracing, I'll show you exactly who we use. Do, 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 do. Oh yeah, we just use SMS. Here you go. You can do everything um, through smszack.com. Um, just go there, check it out. You know, skip trace is skip trace. You're just trying to get information on people um, to get it going. So what else? Any other questions on there? Now, I just try to be consistent in who I use, and I like to use things that work. Um, I'm not going to say they're in bash companies, but I've tried them all. I've tried, I've tried Melissa data, listability. Um, there's three or four others out there, and... I mean, the results were miserable. I just went back to old reliable, so. Okay, good question, Isaiah, all right. Okay, Mr. Answer, uh, your go-to list in, in a saturated market. So here's the problem is, why do you think it's so saturated? Like, I'm in South Florida. You can't get any more saturated than I am. Maybe Southern California, maybe New York. I consistently do deals. You know why? Because I take action every day in this business. And it's not about like running around with my head cut off. I did that in the beginning. I did whatever I had to do. I was a one-man army. And there's no problem with that because I learned a lot. I learned all what you go through on an average deal and what it takes. So my go-to list on a saturated market is going to be the same dang list as in a regular market. Saturation is what you perceive in it. So you have no competition. Your only competition is what you fear of other people taking deals away from you. So eliminate that. What I try to do is from the highest priority to the lowest. I always start with probates and then I work my way backwards. I love the pre-probates in PropStream. That would be one I go to. Um, and then I would probably do the high equity list and I wouldn't focus on absentee owners because in a saturated market, that's what everybody goes to. So I don't care if they're uh, owner occupied or absentee. It doesn't make a difference if I'm going to flip a property. Do I prefer it to be absentee owner? Yeah, but why limit yourself? Um, but it, it truly, if you had to say, hey, Rick, I'm going to nail it down the one list, past probates, I would go to any type of off market list you can get and they're challenging to get. Code violations, hands down my favorite because there's always a problem there. And then um, I love anything with a tax delinquency on it. Anyone who's got a problem on a property, eventually they always need to sell these properties. So st stop assuming it's saturation. So you'd have to define it. So, okay, if you're in Southern California, you're in South Florida, saturated. Guess what? I'm in saturated market. I should just quit according to that with everybody. I don't quit. I keep going. So... If I spend five or seven grand in marketing, they go, oh, Rick, that's expensive. I go, yeah, but I get $30,000, $40,000 deals all day long on it. So what's the difference? I'll be honest with you. When I started, I didn't know how good I had it. I used to send out like 200 postcards, and I thought I was taking massive risk. My phone rang off the hook. It'd take me a week to get through the leads. But I was literally going to crap on my pants when I send them out. So Fast forward today, I'm spending a lot more money. I have a lot more people work with me, but I'm still getting really, really good returns. So it's all relevant. Yes, you are going to have to take some risk, 
your biggest risk in wholesale is your time and you're gonna have to spend some money. But let me ask you, would you rather do that than be stuck in your miserable job, not having the freedom, and do you wanna spend more time with your family, your friends, and really control your life and do whatever you wanna do? I tell you what, I haven't set an alarm clock. This is embarrassing. I probably haven't set an alarm clock in like 12 years. Now, I only set an alarm clock to go fishing or if I have to do something, take somebody to the airport or something like that. Other than that, I don't care. And then I wake up, I still wake up early because I want to get stuff done. I like to work out in the morning, get stuff done, free up my calendar so I can do it. And I don't, I'm not a guy who schedules from like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. I do blocks of time. I can do two hours of uh, what we call logical work. I'll do two hours of what I call creative work. And then I leave time open just to like catch up with friends and family. Like I didn't get in this business to run around my egg cut off. You don't have to do that guys. I know somebody in California, an amazing investor. He does one deal every four to five months and he nets three to $500,000 per deal. And he's like, I don't know why your wholesalers running around with your head cut off. And I honestly, I subscribe to that theory. I love it. So, I do deals. I have a lot of people help me out and that's it. So don't worry about saturated markets. What's the best time to cold call when you can cold call? Like some of us have jobs. We have other things going. Just make the calls. Typically evening time is going to be the best. Don't wait too late. Don't call first thing in the morning. But honestly, Samil, when you make the phone call, that's the best time. Honestly, it's the truth. So many people look for the perfect, there is no perfect time. Are there better times? Yeah, usually like in the evening um, because people are getting off work, but nobody likes the uh, call and dinner interruption. So I like it like right before dinner time. I think that's the best time. All right, Brandon says, I cold call my driving for dollars list 500, didn't get any motivated sellers. Then go get another 500 and do it again and keep doing it, but put them up on a follow-up SMS campaign and just keep going. Try to do door hangers. You can do um, the urgent package. Uh, there's a company that makes them, you can Google it. Um, don't take the FedEx and the, the, uh, the postal packages because it's actually theft. And you can put an urgent letter and set it up on the door when you go back out and doing your drive for dollars. Just keep going, like keep going. You're driving for dollars. I always overlook this one because I think because it's a manual thing. Some of your best ones, my best deals, like when I found probates, they were always the best deals. And driving for dollars will find you a lot of probates because they're vacant, uncared for, beaten down houses nine times out of ten. So, Brandon, just keep going. Five hundred is nothing. Just keep plowing through. Eventually, something will bust. The question is, are you going to bust? Or are you going to bust them? I'm telling. Just keep going. It will work. I promise you. Time and consistent action will get you to your first wholesale deal. Keep driving, man. Oh, I love this one. So Tom Gallon asks, are you a fan of high volume um, dials with a power dollar or more focused list than a single dollar? Me personally, I think it, I just, I just hate the thought. Now you're coming from a guy who had an office with a boiler room, okay? And by the way, Zach was part of my boiler room um, when he was in college. And we had like, you know, those partitions. And uh, if you ever guys saw the room, uh, the movie Boiler Room, where they just go around and they just call all day. Well, we did that with the Mojo Dialer. And my job was to feed 50 to 100,000 leads per week. Do you know how stressful that is on a skip trace? And I mean, it worked. We got deals out of it, but it, it was like a job in itself. It was beyond stressful to get people to show up to work, have them come in the evening. Um, we gave it up. It was just, it was because the cost of, I mean, when you get a $15,000 skip tracing bill and then you got to, you know, you got to cut all the employees in, pay their hourly rates, pay the office. It was an extraordinary bill. And I mean, we were making money, but it was a lot of work. And I don't like doing it. So I like option B a little bit better. But if you have that boiler room mentality and like you get high energy, Zach used to love that. So what he did is he created an environment in his dorm and he rewarded people that helped him connect to motivated sellers. And that works. The problem I have with cold calling the high dollar thing, it's not as scalable as you think it is because 
you got to you got to skip trace it. You got to pay the employees. And then if you really want to run a big center, you actually have to have a lease or either own the real estate. When you start adding up these numbers, they could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I don't want you to spend that kind of money, Tom. I rather you do. I rather you take a a warm list like a probate or a pre probate, get those phone numbers and just single dial them. It's really that simple. It's manageable. If you've ever tried to call, so we used to be able to dial three to 400 numbers per hour. And you start doing these numbers, man. You, I've never seen worse burnout when you sit there and just shove phones on it. People can't keep up, man. It's torture. And by the way, when you put all those dialers, if you guys never experienced like Mojo, I think uh, Zen calls some other ones is they actually hang up on like they'll call three or five people in a row and whoever answers first, they just, the others get an automatic, um, like voicemail and it's usually some BS voicemail like, Oh, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. And, uh, I just, we didn't feel good about it. And everyone I've studied across the country, they have these big clients, they're expensive. And the only way they make money is they outsource. So they find people like you, especially a beginner wholesaler and says, I can do all your cold calling for you. And they're going to charge you some crazy rate. And if it was successful walk through, I would do it. I've tried them all. It, none of them have worked for me. It's just my experience. So, Single dialer on a more focused list is far more effective use of your time. Okay, we're going lightning round, guys. I got I got 10 minutes. So what list should I pull first? Niche list because not so much money to invest. So if you're in the sweat equity mode, which you are, Freddie, you need to go get your code violation list, your tax delinquency list, and here's the best list for you. Driving for dollars. Just go around and look for properties that look suspect. Blue tarps, um, my favorite. If a property is missing a male receptacle, let your friends, um, let your family know what you do and let them know if they know of anyone who's interested in selling a property. By the way, some of the best people that have ever, here's a little secret. My acquisition managers, 90% of them were a bartender at one point in time. You know why? Because bartenders can talk to anybody. Um, I've gotten more deals from bartenders probably than any other source outside of realtors. Just a tip for you. So. Freddie, just grind away. You can do it. It's just you're going to have to work a little bit harder and get these lists. And the driving for dollars list is something that you just go around, collect them, and that's the easiest way to do it. Omar says, I need to hear this. Thanks for the inspiration. Guys, you are the only thing stopping you from your first deal. You just have to take action. So I want you to remove that word massive action because if you take all the wrong action, you're just going to burn out and waste your time. So think about running a race. You have to put blinders on it. Don't worry about what Rick's doing every day. Don't worry about what Max Maxwell's doing. Don't worry about what Zach's doing. Because, listen, you have no idea the struggles people go through. If I told you how many failures I had to go through to get to this point this day, I don't think people would even, like, believe me. And you guys heard all the stories, Michael Jordan, the whole thing. He just didn't get good overnight. He just consistently – perfected his craft. And that's the only difference I've done. And Zach, luckily he started at an early age and I decided I was just going to make things better for my kids. And by the way, I never forced wholesaling on Zach. He just saw that my dad spends more time with me than any other kid I know in my school. And that's how we got curious about it. So he actually worked a regular grocery store. You guys have heard his story. And he just decided he couldn't trade his time for money. And I told him from day one, and I told him book smart, it's going to make you feel good, but it's it's not going to give you the lifestyle that you want. So, okay, lightning round. I got to keep moving. Uh, DeAndre, Rick, do you recommend getting a general liability insurance policy? I'd have to know more about you, but um, if you're doing true wholesaling, you shouldn't have to need it. So you're not licensed, you're not regulated, and you're never owning the property. So the only liability is if you do something absolutely crazy in someone's house, which I've never trained or Zach's never trained you to do it. So as of right now, I would hold off unless there's something else I'm missing. Remember, when we're wholesaling, we're not actually owning the property, guys. We're just putting them on contract and we're selling the paper. Now, if you're buying a rental property or a commercial property, it's a whole different story. So, uh, But if you're starting out wholesaling, absolutely not. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I missed it. Okay. I'm getting caught up here. I got behind. 
Dang it. Okay, you guys got a lot of questions here. Um, trying to. Okay, so. Okay, I'm at. I'm at. I got to speed through some of these. So, uh, I've been trying to to do on market with no luck. By the time I put an offer, because there's a hundred offers already. Yeah, you, you, we don't buy stuff on market. It's it's just a waste of your time. All off market stuff. You have to go out and find your motivated sellers. By the time they hit the market, you're wasting your time. I, I never. The only time I bought off market was in 2010 to 11. It was amazing. And, and back in 2003, but uh, people couldn't move deals and that's why we bought them. So um, you do not want to be where everybody else is. You have to be in the opposite light of it. So get off the market, off market deals, code violations, any type of leads, driving for dollars. You need to get them before they go on the market. Okay. Oh boy. Okay, guys, uh, I'm gonna answer the questions we have right now. And let's see here. Uh, okay, I'm trying not to answer the stuff same twice so we can get as much data out to you as possible. Philip asks, uh, subscribe to Successors Data for an inherited property list. I, I listen. I'm going to tell you on inherited property list. If you do the probates or the pre-probates through listrei.com, that's what I recommend. All those properties are eventually going to be on that list. The properties list, man, they literally sell to everybody, and they're kind of pricey. So, Philip, if you're going to do those type of lists, you have to have a very, very long-term approach, 12 months, because they're hard. Meaning they have a lot of competition, and there's not a lot of leads on them. So, um. I've gotten deals off of them, but when, when we added up the cost for 12 months, it was, it was a little excessive. And I feel like a lot of their data is kind of old, but um, prove me otherwise. Just understand if you're going to do it a month or two, don't do it. It won't work. Uh, you actually need a minimum of six months, if not a year. And this is experience doing inherited lists. Remember, an inherited property is after it's already exited the probate process. So you're going to be so late in the game. I, I, I crush inherited lists because I get them in the pre-probate in the probate stage. Just my recommendation. Bryce says, thank you for that. Um, oh, here's a good one. Okay. How big is your team? So I, let me tell you, in real estate, bigger isn't always better. You know why? because I don't want a nine to five job and I don't want to be stuck. So um, I've been through every game. At, at one point I had um, 14 people on my team. I had a huge office and to be honest with you, I was miserable. I just shut it down one day. I couldn't take it anymore. And it didn't take one day. It took four months to shut down and I paid a lease for two years afterwards. I was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and I was miserable. I was making money, but it was just torture. So, I like lean and mean machines. So right now I do a total of four people on my team. Um, now, sometimes it gets a little bit bigger. I got people that will work on deals with me as they come in if I need help with them. But, um, and we're family operated. So obviously it's me and Zach. Um, I run the company, Zach runs the operations and uh, my wife, helps out with dispositions. And then we have um, acquisitions people and it's split in zones. And it's really, really simple. Guys, don't overcomplicate. We don't rehab properties. We just wholesale properties. So that's what we do. Good question. Bigger isn't always better. Because if you have multiple partners and stuff and say you're doing a million dollars in fees and you have to split them by after taxes, like, and you got to work 40, 50 hours a week. What if you worked 10, 15 hours a week and you just had a lot of fun and you were making a lot of money. That's what I want you guys to do. So, um, all right, let's see. I've been, okay. All right, I got five minutes, guys. I'm gonna roll through these as quick as I can. So I'm cutting off after uh, 6.04. Lulu asks, if you're on a budget 200 bucks to get your first deal, what would you 
would you invest in prop stream in a dialer or prop stream and skip tracing? So I definitely do prop stream through listrei.com. Um, you just, I would honestly probably skip trace yourself as much as you can because you're on a budget and I would massively jump on a driving for dollars list uh, or any type of off market list code violations or anything like that. And you need a lot of activity. So it's not always how much you spend it. It's how effective you are in doing it. So um, I wouldn't mess with a dialer. Don't just don't waste your money on a dialer because you don't need it. Like it's, if anything, you could do like an SMS service if you do it like that. But I mean, I think $200 is not a realistic budget to do that. So I would do driving for dollars. Um, use listrei.com because it's the most cost effective way to get those leads. And any type of off-market leads you can, uh, uh, list you can get. Oh, cool. I appreciate Hey, I, you know, I saw your name, Samil. I love it. I think it's a really cool name. So, um, a dose of Samil. I like it. That's cool. Okay. Isaiah says, who is this Southern California? So it's not somebody, I think it's, it's actually in the San Fran area. Uh, he's actually a very popular guy, but um, he's kind of private. So I'm not going to throw it out there, but um, I'm very, very good friends with him. So if you even go back to my feeds, um, I think there's a picture of me, him, and Zach together. I think uh, I've only met him once. We met at a, uh, at a get together once, but um, actually I'm getting ready to head out to uh, San Fran soon. That's to be determined. Just trying to wait to everything to get open back up, but it's not always about how many deals you do. It's like, how happy are you? Which I was talking to a guy the other day, like, Oh, we did $3.4 million. Oh, he's got six partners. I make more money than you and I do half the work. So which do you want? I want freedom. I want to be able to spend time with my family on a minute's notice and do wild trips, do fishing trips and have fun. But if I got six partners, all this other stuff, like this guy had so many damn meetings going on every day. I'm like, he goes, what's your meetings look like? I go, that's pretty straightforward. Me and my son sit down, we go through the properties, we go through what needs to be done. We look at our goals, we look at our KPIs, and we just we just talk every day. But it, it's like, I love EOS. If you guys look up the book EOS, it tells you how to effectively manage a team so you don't waste time, and I fully believe in it. But I, I don't want to sit in meetings like all day and like just repeat numbers. Uh, okay. We're winding it up here. All right, I got one. So Luke and as a team, 15, I think we spoke uh, the last few weeks. So how to deal with doing this virtually and out of state with taxes? How does it work when you're not in the state you're wholesaling in? So I'm not, you're, you're way ahead of the game and don't guys, if you try to do it by taxes, you're, you're going about it the wrong way. So, um, simply how taxes work, it's the state that you reside in, your business, that's how you're typically going to be taxed. So if you have a corporation or an LLC or you live individually, that's how you're going to report your taxes. So whatever your state taxes, that's how it's going to work. Um, how to do it virtually, listrei.com. It's not complicated. If you can do it locally, especially at your age, you're going to learn a heck that's going to be your easiest path resistance. I don't know what state you're going to be in. Um, you, you can do this anywhere. You're not confined. Technology gives you the ability to do it. What you have to do at 15 is I would become a master at trying to talk with people. And here's the, here's the key is start with your family. So a long time ago when I used to teach my son, um, so I'm big on getting kids involved in sports. I, I think um, boys, girls, it doesn't matter. Teaching them teamwork, um, how to push them to their limits and how to communicate. But like my son, after a wrestling match, especially if he lost, he gets so down on himself. And like the coach used to like, Zach would look down. And I remember at one point the coach would grab his head and look him up and he goes, you look at me when I talk to you, like we are going to connect, you need to connect. And I used that as a teaching moment with Zach. And he's learned by making eye contact with people, you have their engagement, and you know, they're listening to you. 
And that's a teachable moment that um, if Zach didn't correct, it just would have got worse and worse. That's what we do. We're, 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 we're a product of, of how we react to stuff. And once Zach knew that he did that, I spent a year saying, Zach, you got to make eye contact. He just didn't want to make eye contact. He, um, he was a little bit shy. Now you guys know Zach the way he is. So it's just all a teachable at 15, man, the sky's the limit. Start with your family, connect with them, start having deep conversations with them, do more listening than talking. At 15, you'll be able to blow the sky off of it. So think long-term. By the time you're 18 and 20, oh my God, dude, you you could like, you could run circles around Zach. You have so much technology in front of you. So stay active on this. I'm, we're, I'm teaching you for free. I want you to jump in. A lot of the research, if you want, so as you get 15, you can do on your own. You don't require all these services. It just makes your life a little bit easier. So Next time we're on next Friday, let me know what your market you're in. And I tell you what, if you're on, I'll jump you on. Um, make sure you have your parents' um, permission. I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Or we can just communicate this way. So, okay, guys. Um, let's see. Uh, a lot of repeat questions here. Have you? Your niche. So guys, let me know in the comments and the feedback. Um, I do lots of videos. I, I do um, actually several per week. And I try to use my experience and stuff that maybe Zach's not talking to you guys about to help you learn. Go back, refer to the videos. They're pretty short. They're usually under 15 minutes. And I try to have one teachable focus moment and my goal here is so you don't make the same mistakes I did. If I had somebody give you some information 15, 20 years ago, it God only knows what would have happened. I made a lot of mistakes. And my, my purpose of the videos is to have you teach and learn so you don't have to repeat some of my past failures. Zach does the same as well. So you get the perspective from a very, very young new person starting it out. Remember, Zach's still really young. I'm 51. It doesn't matter. I had somebody the other day, you know, 72 starting out. It, your age doesn't matter. So Luke, and listen to me. It doesn't matter what age you are. Your age is just a number in your head. And people who tell, people used to tell Zach all the time, you're too young, you're too young. I said, son, you're not too young. They just don't understand. They are hypnotized. They're following what 95% of the society does. We don't do that. And because we broke that mindset, he consistently makes six-figure deals six figures with his eyes shut well before he ever turned 20. So it took me till my thirties to make that kind of money. And I had to work my ass off for it. Not saying Zach doesn't work his butt off. He just works smarter than the average person. So, okay. Wait, 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 I missed it. Uh, we talked about this the other day, uh, two minutes I'm off here, guys. Specific filters for pre-probate. I just like off off-market properties. If your list is too long, you can filter it down from there. But I would minimize your filters because you want to get as many as you can on that list. Troll asks, what steps entering the new market? Just use listaria.com. It'll do a lot of the, the research for you. You do not want to be fishing in the wrong pond, guys. And if you're doing a virtual market and say there's a ton of competition, you have no idea, no connections there, I would not start out doing that. Um, you can use the data in listaria.com to find it all out. So, who says thank you? I'll check it out. Eric says we'll do. So, David's got a question here. And I don't have any. How much do you usually spend in a marketing month? I. So, we're going to end this on is what I spend and you spend. You can't use it as a barometer. I've been doing this 19 years. Um, I've spent as much as 30 grand in a month and as little as zero. And I can tell you this, you can outstrip yourself if you spend too much money. A lot of us think, well, if I spent 3000 this month um, and I got two deals off of it, I can spend 6000 next month and get four deals off of it. It doesn't always work that way. So you don't want to outstrip your marketing ability. I've done this more times than I can tell you. So if I were going to spend five grand, I go, okay, 
team were to get together, we're going to double our income and we're going to spend 10. It never works out that way. So if you're ever going to do marketing, what I would do is find out the marketing that works, the, the areas you're getting deals from, the types of deals from getting it. That is your best data. Your data doesn't lie to you. It tells you the truth. You can't spin it. And then from there, then you can bump it up 15, 20% and see if it starts to get scalable. This is not Jeopardy where you double down. It, it, there's no daily double. It doesn't work. I've tried it. I'm telling you, if you think you're just going to double a budget, um, I purposely don't want to throw a number because I don't want someone to use me as a gauge. So I've been doing this a long time. Um, some months I spend a lot of money. Some months we ramp it back. It's, it's a constant progress. And by the way, we look at it daily and weekly, monthly, quarterly, bi-yearly and yearly. So um, I just don't want people to use me as a guide because most people I help out here are starting out with wholesaling. And I don't want you to go, well, if Rick spends 15 grand, I can't do this. No, I, my first deal, I spent zero. End of story. So, uh, okay, one more question and I'm wrapping it up. Ariel asked, if a house is going to auction for pre-foreclosure, can I call the homeowner and give an offer? Absolutely, yes. I'm just telling you, you won't be the first one that contacts them. It's a commonly used um, tactic. Um, what you want to do is the minute they're in pre-foreclosure, try to reach out to them. Um, once it gets usually within 30 days to auction, it's usually a waste of time. Just at least it is in my market because it's so hard to stop the auction. It takes... It takes a really good lawyer and somebody has to spend it. I don't want to spend $1,500, $2,000 to have someone to stop an auction only to have the house foreclosed on. And I don't buy it. I'm out $1,500. So catch them early. When it gets close to auction and stuff, it's usually a nightmare. That's just my experience. So guys, um, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. Um, let me see here. Hit that like button. And most importantly, um, as a favor to me and Zach, because we do this all from the kindness of our heart. You guys know I haven't hit you with one product and it's my promise and guarantee because I do real estate full time and I love it. So I don't have a coaching business and I don't think you have to pay $10,000 for a guru to teach you this business. You didn't learn your ABCs by doing a guru. This is the same thing. What I'm looking for in return is to make the biggest, baddest community out there of wholesalers that want to make six figures as fast as possible. I'm living proof. My son is living proof. I've worked with thousands of people. And I just think the whole guru coaching thing's out of control. It's ridiculous. And I think wholesaling is the starting point. It is the gateway to get into real estate investing. And I just want to get you started on that. If we can develop a relationship from there. We'll have fun by growing an unstoppable, unfiltered community where you know you're not going to get pounded over the head. The only way you can do that is you have to subscribe, you have to share, you got to like the videos and just learn guys. And let's share our story and have fun with it. So I will see you in the next video. You're probably going to see Zach next. Um, I know he's got some stuff lined up, which should be a lot of fun. So guys, go out there. The only thing stopping you from getting your first wholesale deal or your first $100,000 net income from wholesaling is you. You got to take consistent, regular precise action. I know you can do it. You're no different than me. I'm just like you. You guys are just like Zach and you're like-minded like me. You, you're trying to do what 95% of the world doesn't do and you want to make a difference and be a difference maker in your community and your family. And I guarantee you can do it with wholesaling. Guys, this is Rick with Flip with Rick and I will see you next Friday at the exact same time, guys. See ya.